So our first emergent property of water was cohesion. And what exactly does cohesion mean? Well, it says cohesion is the bonding of a high percentage of the molecules to neighboring molecules. So basically what that means is when somebody uses the term cohesion, they're referring to the ability of water molecules to stick together. If you think about it, when you drink some water, you don't want to drink one water molecule and then go find another one and drink that, right? That wouldn't be very efficient. So water molecules need to cling together and the way they do that is through this process called cohesion. And then the way they specifically bond to one another, again, is through that hydrogen bonding we described earlier. So this cohesion is really helpful, not only for us, but for uh, different types of plants and tall trees that need this water uh, to survive. So here's an example of a large tree that you might find. As you could imagine, trees bring in water through their roots. And if you go on to take biology too, you'll learn about all these different water conducting cells that can bring in water and supply the leaves that may be hundreds of feet up in the air with the water that they need. And so again, it's important that this water stick together or the water molecules stick together so that they can be transported to the top of the tree. And in a minute, we're gonna talk about another method of how trees bring water up to their leaves and that's called adhesion. So, adhesion sounds pretty similar to the word cohesion, except for there's one difference. Adhesion is actually the clinging of one substance to another. So, in our example, we're, we're talking about water molecules. So, if we go back to our, our tree example, we can wonder, or we might wonder, all right, well, our water molecules are sticking together through this process called cohesion. But how is the tree actually going to grab a hold of all those water molecules? Well, what it's going to do is bring the water up through this method called adhesion. And what I mean is that those water molecules are going to grab on to the cells inside the tree. And the process of those water molecules kind of bonding to another substance, in our example the tree, is this process called adhesion. So the adhesion of water to the walls of the cells and plants helps counter that downward pull of gravity it's going to experience. And therefore, our really tall tree can bring water from its roots all the way up to the leaves that may be hundreds of feet in the air. Now when talking about water, another thing you have to consider or just mention is uh, this thing called surface tension. And everybody's probably heard of that and, and you know that um, if you've gone out to a pond or you sit on the edge of a river, you can see leaves floating down the water. Okay, so why don't they just, you know, break the surface and sink to the bottom? Well, water tends to have this kind of invisible film over it, if you will. And that's what we refer to as surface tension. But technically, um, the definition they give it is a measure of how difficult it is to stretch or break the surface of a liquid. So this kind of again, makes water behave as though it has this kind of coating on top of it. Another example might be if you lay a needle sideways down on top of the water. It's going to stay there. It's not going to sink underneath the water unless disturbed because of that surface tension. This little critter is kind of cool. This is a water strider. And you'll see these in ponds and wetlands. And what they do is they basically kind of scamper across the surface of water, and again, they're able to do that because of that surface tension. Now, the second emergent property we discussed uh, when we were talking about the four main properties of water was the fact that water has the ability to moderate temperature. So here it says, it does that by absorbing heat from air that is warmer, and releasing the stored heat to air that might be cooler. So I like to use examples. So let's use an example here. We're pretty close to the beach, so lots of us might like to drive a couple hours and go relax on the beach. And one thing you might notice when you go down there is the climate or the air temperature always seems to be a little bit more moderate or more consistent than it might be if you go farther inland. So it's definitely gonna be more consistent than if you went all the way to the Midwest or someplace like that. 
And the reason for that is because of the fact that there's so much water around. So what happens is that, let's say winter's coming to an end and it's starting to warm up outside. Well, as it starts to warm up, it may not seem like it's warming up quite as much at the coast because all that cool water is gonna absorb some of that heat from the air into the body of water itself. And then if you look at the reverse of that, you can kind of see how it, it works itself out there. So as it starts to cool off outside, that water that's kind of warmed up is gonna to start to release that heat into the cool surrounding air. Now, heat and temperature are something that can be <clears throat> kind of commonly confused. But before we kind of distinguish those two terms, we have to first mention something called kinetic energy. And kinetic energy is considered the energy of motion. So I always think of somebody jogging outside. If somebody's running, right, they're moving. So they're utilizing this thing called kinetic energy or the energy of motion. Now we can apply kinetic energy to this kind of term we use that we call heat, right? And really what heat is, is it's a measure of the total amount of kinetic energy due to molecular motion, right? So when you heat up a pot of water, those molecules are gonna start to move faster and faster. So, so we could determine the heat based off of how much kinetic energy was going on within those molecules? How quickly are they moving? Now temperature is actually how we measure how intense heat is, right? So temperature measures the intensity of heat. So while heat is kind of the amount of kinetic energy that's going on, temperature is our way of kind of quantifying how hot something may be. Now, water's, water has high specific heat, and this can be kind of confusing to people when, when we talk about the specific heat of a substance, and I don't want you to get too caught up on it, but we have to kind of have a standard to, what we, to where we can kind of compare, you know, other things against it. So here it says the specific heat of a substance is the amount of heat that must be absorbed or lost for one gram of that substance to change its temperature by one degree Celsius. So if somebody's studying the specific heat of maybe a chemical reaction, or you know, there's all sorts of, of different experiments somebody might do with this, they're gonna use the specific heat of a substance as kind of a standard to compare their results to. So I really just want you to be familiar with the fact that scientists that might be studying kind of heat transformations or heat reactions are going to be comparing it against this one gram of heat that has to be absorbed or lost. And um, again, I like examples. So water has a high specific heat, which allows it to minimize temperature fluctuations to within permits that permit life, right? If you're living, you can't get too hot, you can't get too cold. The human body or, you know, any animal body or living organism requires a certain range of, of temperature to survive. So here it says on the very bottom of the page, there's two bullets and it says heat is absorbed when hydrogen bonds break. It also says heat is released when hydrogen bonds form. So a specific example that we can kind of compare this to is when we are in the kitchen and we're gonna boil some water. So Everybody's done this. Everybody can kind of relate to this example, but you take out your pot and you put water in it and you set it on the stove. As your, your water starts to get warmer and warmer and that kinetic energy is increasing because those little molecules in the water are starting to move faster and faster, eventually we start to see these bubbles, of form, these bubbles form when the water starts to boil. So what's happening there is that more heat is being absorbed and because of that, those hydrogen bonds between our water molecules are starting to break. And those bubbles we see are actually the oxygen molecules being released. Now, let's say we've finished boiling whatever it is we're cooking and we turn off the burner. What happens is that water's gonna start to cool back down and we're gonna see less and less of those bubbles forming. 
what's happening at that point is that heat is going to start being released, right? The water is getting cooler, so the heat that was, in, that was within our water is being released, and those hydrogen bonds are at that point going to start forming again. So that's what they mean by heat is absorbed when hydrogen bonds break and heat is released when hydrogen bonds form. Now, evaporative cooling is something else we can, we can kind of relate to. So let's give a definition to evaporation real quick. It says evaporation is the transformation of a substance from a liquid to a gas. Okay, we, we're all familiar with that. If you take a bucket of water and you put it outside, you come back a couple days later, you're going to notice that there's less water in your bucket. And that's because of this process we call evaporation. So again, if somebody's studying the rate of evaporation or the, the heat of vaporization of, you know, a substance, they have to have something to compare their experimental groups against. So they developed this heat of vaporization, which they describe as it's the quantity of heat a liquid must absorb for one gram of it to be converted from a liquid to a gas. So again, they're just using that one gram as kind of the standard with which they can compare their results. And evaporative cooling specifically is due to water's high heat of vaporization. Okay, and so it allows water to cool a surface. So if you think about that, if you're outside and maybe you're exercising or you're just exerting yourself, you're going to start to sweat. So the surface of your skin is going to have a liquid layer on it. And what happens is that through evaporative cooling, that liquid is going to eventually be turned into a gas. And what happens is that those hotter molecules are going to evaporate first. So you're losing that heat more quickly, which allows you to cool off or allows the surface of your skin to cool off. So to finish up this lecture, we're just going to talk a little bit about acids and bases. And, and um, if you guys have ever had a fish tank, you've probably had to deal with having water that might be too acidic or too basic or something like that. But I think we've all heard of acids or bases, but let's kind of dig in a little bit further and see what they're all about. So basically, water can dissociate into two different types of ions. So water can kind of break apart or break down into what they call hydronium or hydroxide ions. And changes in the concentration of these two different types of ions can have a great impact on living organisms because they can affect how acidic or how basic water can become. Let's specifically talk about the difference between an acid and a base. So here it says an acid is any substance that increases the hydrogen ion concentration of a solution. All right, so what does that mean? Basically, it's saying that if you have a substance that causes there to be more hydrogen ions in our aqueous solution, it's probably going to be considered an acid. Okay, so acids have more hydrogen ions in them than a basic solution would have. So the definition it gives to a base is any substance that reduces the hydrogen ion concentration of a solution. So if you were to have a basic solution, you're going to have less hydrogen ions than you would have in an acidic solution. So if you talk about acids and bases, you have to refer to something called the pH scale. And basically, the pH scale is how we're able to measure how acidic or how basic a solution is. And it ranges on a scale that goes from 0 to 14. Okay, so again, if we're talking about pH or if we're talking about acids and bases, we're talking about how many hydrogen ions are in a solution. Okay, so... The pH of a solution is going to be low in an acid. And this confuses people sometimes because in an acidic solution, you have more hydrogen ions. But if you're talking about the pH scale, if I say the pH of a solution is zero, that's a really low pH. And so what that means is that's going to be a very strong acid. On the other hand, if we're talking about pH 
bases are going to be high on the pH scale. And we'll look at a picture of this in just a minute and it will help clarify. So here's our pH scale. And as you can see, it ranges from on the top, there's a red bar that says pH is equal to zero. Whereas down on the bottom, you have kind of a pinky orange colored bar that says pH is equal to 14. So you have to have a pH between zero and 14. All right. And again, we said on the pH scale, acids are on the lower end. Okay. So you have, it says pH of zero. That's a really strong acid. We have battery acids, hydrofluoric acid. Okay, these are really, really dangerous acids that have a lot of hydrogen ions in them. On the other end, we said bases tend to have a high pH. Okay, so if you have a pH of 14, that means you have a very strong base. It's about as basic as you can get. And so an example here is liquid drain cleaner. Okay, pH of 13 says bleaches oven cleaner, right? So don't let that confuse you. A low pH means you have a strong acid with a lot of hydrogen ions in it. A high pH means you have a strong base with very few hydrogen ions in them. So you might have asked yourself, or not, what is the optimum pH for a living organism. Well, we want our internal cells or the pH within our cells to maintain um, kind of a range around seven or a value of around seven. So the internal pH of most living cells must remain close to pH seven. And they typically call that a neutral pH. Okay. Now, when you're referring to pHs, you also want to consider uh, something that they call buffers. And buffers are basically substances that help to minimize fluctuations in your pH. Okay, so here it says buffers are substances that minimize changes in the concentrations of hydrogen and hydroxide ions in a solution. All right, and at the beginning we said that water molecules to tend to dissociate into those two items. So if hydrogens are what are affecting, or hydrogen ions are what are affecting the pH of our solution, we want to minimize that change. So let's say we have a fish tank, and our fish need a pH close to 7. Well, what we can do is if we're having problems keeping our pH, the pH in our water around 7, what we can do is we can put in a buffer. Usually it's like powder or something you can buy at the pet store. So you can put in buffers that are going to prevent that water from becoming either too acidic or too basic and that's going to maintain the health of your fish and basically what a buffer is it's just kind of a an acid base pair that work together and um, they kind of reversibly combine with hydrogen ions so you don't get that big fluctuation in pH now something that was in the news um, quite a bit you know, probably about 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, and it's still a problem, is the threat of something called acid precipitation. And this is kind of, um, you know, really, really been noticed within the past 20 years. And basically, acid precipitation is something that refers to any form of precipitation, whether it be rain, snow, fog. But what they were finding is that whenever this precipitation would come down, they were finding that the pH in it was exceptionally low, lower than about a pH of 5.6. So this rain that was coming down was extremely acidic. And like we just said, most living organisms require a pH to be about 7. So it was, you know, causing a lot of problems in ponds and um, in different forests up in the northeast. It was, it was a pretty big deal. And basically what happens is as we pollute the environment more and we put more pollutants into the air, it's causing that precipitation to become more acidic. And what happens is eventually it damages the life and damages different ecosystems um, throughout the world. So here we have another illustration of the pH scale, again going from 0 to 14. And you can see on the top of um, the picture, or on the bottom end of the pH scale, 
we have this kind of area that they consider acid rain, okay? And so you can see, depending on what the pH is, how it starts to affect the environment in different um, living organisms. So at about a pH of four, we can see that at this point, fish reproduction can be affected, right? So that's not a good thing for um, food sources or if you're uh, interested in fishing just as a recreational activity, that's gonna start to impact those fish populations. If, it, if the pH gets even lower, we're actually gonna start to have fish die off, right? So, so acid rain isn't a good thing and, and um, fortunately, it's a lot of attention has been brought to it and people are starting to um, become more aware of it and are starting to find solutions to the problem. This final slide just kind of illustrates um, just a lot of the, the effects that have happened because of acid rain. And in the top left picture, you can see, again, when we put pollutants into the air, when we put sulfates in the air, and so on and so forth, they get deposited into the atmosphere. And then when we get the buildup of clouds or the formation of um, you know different situations where we're going to get precipitation, all those pollutants start to come back down to the earth in the form of acidic precipitation. And the rest of the pictures just kind of show you some aftermath effects of different ecosystems that have been impacted by highly acidic rain or highly acidic snow. So there's entire forests that have been killed off because of it. And then on the bottom right hand corner, you have a statue and you can see how it's starting to erode that kind of rock or that uh, geologic formation that's built that statue and how it's starting to kind of erode it or um, kind of break it down a little bit. So our third emergent property said that water tends to expand upon freezing. And why is that important? Why would we care that water expands when it freezes? Well, to think about that, we have to start um, looking at the insulation of bodies of water by floating ice. Okay, so if water expands when it freezes, basically that means that it's going to become less dense than the liquid water that surrounds it. And in essence, that means that ice floats right? So the first arrow says solid water or ice is less dense than liquid water and therefore floats in liquid water. And the hydrogen bonds in ice tend to be more ordered, right? They're just more structured than they are in liquid water, which is what contributes to the fact that ice floats or the fact that ice is less dense than the liquid water. But this is great, but why do we care? Let's find out on the next slide. So <clears throat> when we think about icebergs or floating frozen water, um, we have to think or consider the fact that underneath frozen water is liquid water, right? So if you have a pond and let's say it's freezing outside and that water froze, what would happen if it sank? So let's say the top layer of our water froze and sank. That means that the cycle's just gonna continue, right? So the next layer of top water will freeze, that will sink, and eventually our entire pond would freeze. Well, that's a big problem for any animal or plant or you know, any living organism that's in that water because it's eventually gonna freeze as well. So what ice does on top of water is that it kind of provides insulation to all the organisms that are below it, right? Some people like to go deep sea, not deep sea fishing, ice fishing, and um, they can, you know, crack through the ice and start fishing. And that's because those animals are able to survive under that layer of ice. So this uh, illustration says, an ice, each molecule is hydrogen bonded to four neighbors in a 3D crystal. Because the crystal is spacious, ice has fewer molecules than an equal volume of liquid water. Okay, basically what I want you to get from this is that ice is less dense and basically becomes a barrier that protects the liquid water below. And it says the marine organism here, which is a type of shrimp found under the Antarctic ice, is able to survive. So by, you know, the expansion of, of, of water when it freezes, we get this protective layer that, that protects all those other living organisms. And what's really interesting is that most liquids, when they freeze, they become more dense. Water is one of the few exceptions. Now, another emergent property is that water is the solvent of life. 
So what is a solvent? Well, let's first break down these, these four little bullets, and then we'll give you an example, and this is kind of the best example I've come across. But when we use the term solution, I think everybody has heard this term, but what exactly is a solution? It says, a solution is a liquid that is a completely homogeneous mixture of two or more substances. Okay, well, what is a solvent? We said water's the solvent of life. That simply means that it's some sort of dissolving agent, right? So water is going to dissolve different substances at some point. Our third arrow says we have to consider something called a solute. And it says a solute is a substance that is dissolved. So water, in lots of situations, is going to dissolve different types of solutes. And so let's... Um, Think about those little flavor packets you can buy at the store these days so that your water tastes more interesting. Okay, you can go to the store and you can buy just many different flavors. Okay, well, what happens is you take, you take um, a sugar packet. Let's say we buy like a strawberry sugar packet. Okay, that's going to be considered our solute. We're going to dissolve it in our water. And our water, again, is going to be the solvent. Well, once we've mixed those two together, we're going to get the creation of this solution. Okay, it's just going to be kind of a homogenized mix of our solute and solvent. And in science, whenever you're talking about water as being the solvent, you would call that an aqueous solution. So again, water's really important, okay? If it's the, the universal solvent or the solvent of life, um, basically, that means that those different regions of the polar water molecule are able to interact with different types of ionic compounds, again, many of which we call solutes, and it's able to dissolve them. So I think a really important example of that is the fact that we're continuously having to take in water as a living organism. And that's because of the fact that our body produces different types of ions, and we eat different types of foods that may be salty and we need to be able to break that stuff down and dissolve it, and water's the reason we're able to do that. So this last slide just illustrates, you know, and kind of wraps up what we just discussed, but in the top picture you see these little red and white molecules, and those are our water molecules, and you can see that they can break down um, different types of ions. So in this example, they're using sodium chloride which sodium chloride is just salt, right? It's kind of like our table salt. So water is able to kind of break down those solutes and, and eventually turn it into a homogeneous solution, right? And um, I want to leave you with this slide, which I really want everybody to kind of burn into their memory because it's uh, something that we're going to talk about over and over again in this class. And, and those two terms are hydrophobic and hydrophilic substances. Okay, so first let's break those words down. Hydro means water, right? So at the first bullet we see the term hydrophilic. Okay, half of that word means water, but if you were to look at the meaning of philic, you would find that it means it's... Um, has an affinity for something or it's loving. So if you break that word down, it means water loving. Okay, so any type of hydrophilic substance is a substance that can interact with water. Okay, it has an affinity for it. Well, the opposite of that is something called a hydrophobic substance. So let's break that word apart. Hydro again means water and a phobic means fearing, right? If you have a phobia, you're afraid of something. So a hydrophobic substance is something that does not like to interact with water, right? So it's kind of considered water-fearing. And there's lots of both of these examples that you find in nature, but just keep that in the back of your mind and understand the difference between a hydrophilic and a hydrophobic substance.